roundtable discussion on gentrification and housing uh, activism here in Bushwick. Uh, I wanted to take the time just to introduce some of the folks who are on our panel today, two of them of which were interviewed for the project for Cities for People Not for Profit. Our first panelist is Josh Carrera, who grew up in Bushwick off of the Wilson Avenue stop on the L train. He is deeply committed to organizing around issues of housing and environmental justice. In his free time, Josh likes to ride his bike, hike through fall foliage, and travel around the world. And he has been to many countries in Latin America and is excited to start exploring Asia and Europe. Our second uh, panelist is Julian Gomez, who is a tenant organizer for Make the Road New York. His job consists mainly of leading outreach efforts to identify community members that are at risk for eviction, facing harassment, or could otherwise benefit from legal assistance on housing issues, educating community members on legal protections available to combat harassment and to maintain safe, affordable housing, as well as the rezoning impact on the community, setting up tenant associations and buildings and developing Know Your Rights workshops uh, re related to anti-displacement. Our next panelist is Gladys Puglia, who was born in Ecuador, grew up in Manhattan's Lower East Side, and moved to Bushwick in 1998. She experienced harassment as landlords tried to evict her and offer her buyouts. In 2000, when her landlord was refusing to do any repairs, a neighbor told her that Make the Road New York could help. Gladys walked through the door to Make the Road New York and has been involved with that organization ever since. She began organizing her community in her free time and learned about the rights of tenants. Her leadership grew as she organized tenants' rights support groups and was involved in rallies and press conferences. And she has been elected to the board of directors for four terms. And New York is her hometown and this is where she decides to stay. Uh, Ariel Riapos is a 22-year-old activist originally from Jersey City, currently living in and building community around Bushwick. She's the co-founder and lead organizer of G-Rebels, a grassroots organization dedicated to building solidarity among black and brown communities. She is a recent graduate of Pace University, where after coming forward with her own Me Too story senior year, she and members of Pace UN Rape organized a walkout for women and femmes to force the administration to meet student demands for policy changes within Title IX for stronger protections for survivors of sexual assault and intimate partner violence on the campus. Currently, she works at Equality for Flatbush. So please uh, extend a warm round of welcome to our panelists for joining us today. And so we wanted this to be somewhat semi-formal, but then also sort of casual. We're going to try to play around with that balance. But I wanted to ask and open up questions first to all the panelists. First, I wanted to ask you all, how long have you lived in Bushwick, and what has your experience of housing been like? And I'm just going to pass the mic around, and you can all. Uh, thanks, Cynthia. Um, so hi, all. My name is Josh. Um, I grew up here, but I haven't lived here since 2014. Um, in 2006, my family faced our first eviction. Uh, we grew up on the cater between Wilson and Knickerbocker. And then in um, 2014 is when the second eviction happened. So, um, but I'm still, I still come here. I'm, I'm involved in May Day. I'm one of the core volunteers. Um, and I come here because I still miss Bushwick. Bushwick is my lived reality. It's, it's the New York that I know. Um, so that's kind of, um, yeah, my background and how I, why I show up here. And my experience with housing, man, how, I mean, if, if you've lived here, if you live here, like many cities, like many neighbor, neighborhoods in New York City and in cities across the country, there's a housing crisis and we can't afford to live here. Um, these condos and these high rises just pop up around the corner. Um, and, it, and it's accelerating, so it's, it's been a really struggle, it's been really depressing, um, but, you know, continue to show up, so, check. Thanks, Joshua. My name is Julian, and I don't live in Bushwick, but I spend probably 80% of the time working here, so I feel like I live here. And my experience working on housing has been as Joshua said, very depressing. 
Because um, I would like to love here, to live here, but I can't. I can't pay the rent. It's too damn high. And I feel like building the connection with tenants and getting to know their, their stories, their backgrounds, have given me like enough information to to feel the same, right? To feel like an other Bushwick resident. So I feel like that that been my experience. Um, I have lived in Bushwick for three years, um, and my experience with housing has been pretty much what everybody has said. Um, we came here, we were, uh, I, I came here with a bunch of roommates. We could no longer live at the place that we were living previously. And so we found um, somewhere to live here. Um, and pretty much since the day we moved in, our landlord has been trying to get us out. Um, so, and none of us intend to leave. Um, our landlord has offered people in our building money to get out. Um, my downstairs neighbor has have lived there for over 10 years and he offered them $10,000 to get out. Um, they didn't obviously they didn't take it um, and good because what can you do in $10,000 in the current like with the current housing crisis going on um, and yeah and also just the the struggle of kind of my generation like the 20 something year old to all of us you know we can't move out and get our own place we're all like kind of packed in living the, everybody that I know that's my age has two or more roommates at least um, so that's been my experience with housing. Uh, good evening. I have lived here almost 20 years. And as for she saying, fighting with housing, I, I think I've been fighting with housing since the 20 years with my first landlord and second landlord. And the second landlord is getting harder to fight. It's getting hard every year to fight with him every time he takes me to court. But I'm there, like I told him. I'm here with my group, with this organization, with my lawyer, and I'm not leaving my apartment. And he always just laughs. But I say, keep laughing. The, the last one that laughs is the one that wins. <laughs> and I've been happening like, what, five times or six times that I've been in court with him. Um, I, I was, uh, last month, I was in court. He tried, he already got the eviction notice gave me only six days to move out, and I won. I gave him what he wanted, it, and then and now he has to give me what I want. But like I said to everybody in, in the community, the one that comes to the meetings every Thursday, I tell him, fight. Don't let go. Just fight for your apartment. Don't let go, because once you let go, you're not gonna make it out there. And I said, do as much as you can. Find out as much as you can. Learn your rights, but fight for it. Don't let it go. Thank you. Thank you so much. I guess the first question I'm gonna open up, I'm gonna open up and direct it to Josh. What comes to mind when you think of Bushwick? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I, I, well, two things come to mind. I, I have a love-hate relationship with Bushwick. I love it because it's, you know, it, it formed who I am and, and my identity and how I see the world as a New Yorker. Uh, so I love it because of that. You know, Bushwick, uh, when I was growing up in Bushwick, I grew up on, um, uh, on the side where, uh, at least on my side, there was a lot of black and Puerto Rican families, working families. Um, I grew up with hip-hop in Bushwick. Um, so that's, that was kind of like my whole life, and I love that. Um, and then the, when I, the other part that I think of Bushwick is when I spend time on this side of Bushwick, uh, where Mayday is, and then closer to like DeKalb and Jefferson, then that's like the new Bushwick, or the Bushwick that's like threatening um, what we that grew up here have always had, which is community, um, affordable rent. Um, so that's kind of what I think of Bushwick. I think of the Bushwick that used to be, and the Bushwick that's on the verge of becoming something different. And, um, and it's hard, it's really, really hard, but I, but I keep coming back because it's who I am. Um, so yeah. 
And if anybody wants to step in with their own memories, feel free to share. I'm just going to go ahead and move on, though, if nobody else wants to add anything. Putnam Avenue was the, in between Irving and Knickerbocker, was the children place. Because everybody in the, in the apartments had children. And that's why we fight for that park, that little park that we had in, in front of my building. We fight to fix it, and we fix it. It took us 10 years to fix it. Because that assembly person or whoever, whoever was in charge of there, gave us very, a hard time to get the money. The thing is that we were a family. The whole block was a family. And everybody in the neighborhood were jealous of us because we were making our block party just for the children. And it was full of children on that day. So it's hard to see how much it changed Putnam or Bushwick. I'm not saying just my street, it's everybody, every corner it has changed. And it hurts to see so many families being displaced and gone. Gone. There's no more the family that we used to have, the community togetherness, fighting for something, it was not there no more. It's not. And that's what I tell the new people that come in. Please, in get involved with the family that lives here now. Be part of it. Don't be a stranger. And they just tell me just a passing by. And that hurts. When they tell you that, it means the rent is going to keep going higher because they're just passing by. Thank you. So this next uh, question is, uh, I'm going to start off with Julian. And if anybody else wants to chime in, feel free to. What are the top three challenges that you think is facing the Bushwick community? Well, rent, I'll say that's the number one challenge. Um, well, this is my personal opinion. So I think the, the second challenge is the uh, being willing to organize. Right? That is, that, is, that is a challenge. It's challenging. And the third one, um, I'll say that it's like keeping the community sense, the community feeling. Um, well, rent, I think, is, is high. As, as Gladys said, it's going to keep going higher and higher. And People are spending over 50% or of their income on rent, so they are making choices on um, paying my rent or buying my groceries. So, yeah. The, um, on the community, the community sense, I think it's, it's hard as the community itself is changing, right? It's changing the community members, are changing, so it's actually hard to keep the community organized and in the same way, because it's not the same people. There might be some obstacles as the language, right? So it's really hard to keep the community sense. And the, the other one was um, organizing. I think a big chunk of the community here is undocumented. And they're afraid just to take action because they, they don't want to be exposed. They want to keep in the shadows because they have their families here. They don't want to be deported. So I think that is another challenge. And I'm talking from the organizing side, right? Maybe some of the other panelists have other opinions or their thoughts, but I think those are um, three challenges that the community is facing right now. wants to add and a lot of this may come up later on if you want to chime in later that's fine um, in regards to like these impacts that gentrification is having in the neighborhood 
um, for Josh and Ariel, I wanted to particularly ask you both, how do you feel for younger generations and folks coming into the neighborhood, how can they impact the change that's occurring because of gentrification? What have you seen work? What have you seen not work? Any f insights or feedback you have on that? Uh, well, hmm, that's a good question. Um, I, I'm just going to share more. Well, I feel like I need to share this challenge that I've had um, as a as a person that I, I you know I, I ended up here in Bushwick in um, '97. Uh, before that, uh, my family lived in uh, uh, Left Rock City in Queens. Um, and one of the challenges that I've always had is that when I became politically aware or politically conscious. I latched on to this identity uh, of being a Bushwick native. Um, and it, it felt comfortable to do that, but as I was looking around people my age and realizing that, you know, I don't know, I no longer live with my family because after my family got evicted, they ended up in the Bronx and I had to find my own place because my mom has Section 8. And based on the amount of money that I make, she would lose her Section 8. So I couldn't even live with my family. You know, I had to find my own place. And because rent, and it's a weird thing, because I make enough money that she would lose her Section 8, but I don't make enough money to get my own apartment because I have student loans. So that means I have to end up living with three or four roommates, um, which sucks, because I bet, you know, in the 90s, I'm assuming I could have found my own apartment and, like, started my own life from that perspective. So that's the challenge for um, people my age that either grew up here or are moving here that we can't afford to live the way our parents lived. Um, and so we need to figure out our own strategy as young people that either have lived in this neighborhood or are moving to these kind of neighborhoods. Like, what is our role? Because um, it's very different from, like, people that have been here multiple generations and maybe have home ownership or um, other forms of privilege to let them stay in the neighborhood. Uh, unlike my mom, who was a single mother with Section 8. So I'm not d directly answering your question, but I'm saying, like, my generation has to figure it out. Um, I think that, um, <clears throat> yeah, I totally am in agreement with everything that Josh said. Um, I also think that a really this is now more than ever the time for us to be continuing to build community as much as we can. Um, I think that a lot of one of the ways or what enables gentrification, especially, um, and this is what I've learned working at Equality for Flatbush, with the, which is a um, tenants' rights grassroots organization. Um, people feel uh, shame that they're being taken to court by their landlords or that they're being harassed by their landlords. They don't speak, they may know all their neighbors and they don't tell anybody about it and so it's able to happen in secret. And so landlords are able to harass you and you know, say that you owe them money that you don't actually owe them or take you to court on, you know, to try and evict you for whatever you know, fake reasons, but nobody really says anything about it and so the, like, the community can't really help you out. Um, there was, I was witnessing an eviction um, in Flatbush and you know, the, and we got the neighbors to come out and they were like, why didn't you tell us? We would have, I, I, I knew a lawyer, I could have helped you out or I would have told you that didn't make sense because they're, they're, tr they're tending to prey on families and elders um, who may just get a little bit nervous and then just decide to pack up and leave instead of to stay and fight. Or even younger people um, to, you know, because we don't have the resources. Like Josh was saying, our generation, we're burdened with student loans. I don't have money for a lawyer. I can't, you know, if my, if my landlord tried to take me to court, but that's where we kind of can lean on our community to say, hey, no, you can't get away with this because the whole building is watching you. You know, you can't get away with this because the whole block is watching you. Try and evict me and the block is going to come out, you know? that kind of thing where we can have like unity in the face of all of this craziness and chaotic and also for like you know newer people coming in myself as somebody who's only been here for a few years is very important to meet your neighbors because what tends to happen is a lot of the like you know the gentrifiers who come in they don't like you know is only in for a year and then they're out and they don't meet anybody they don't know their neighbors they don't you know you don't even know their name really um, so I think it's very important to kind of push back against that and to and to build even more community in this time because I think that that's so important and we can form a united front against these issues. So that kind of leads to my next question, which is about community roots, and I wanted to give uh, Julian and uh, Gladys a chance to respond to that in regards to like how does one develop these community roots that are so necessary to fight this. 
uh, apathy you see from folks coming in from the outside? Well, I think if, if you look at your hand, you have five fingers. And each finger is, has different size, right? It's different from the other one. But they are attached to, to the whole, right? To the whole hand. So this is community. And like, even though there are different sizes, different measures, they are connected, they are united. So I think that for long-term members in Bushwick and for new residents, new members of Bushwick, I think this needs to keep tight, right? And I pay attention to the new residents because sometimes they don't, they're not aware of their role, right? Getting into a new neighborhood. I feel like they don't think about who was before, what family was before. I wonder if they ask themselves what had to happen in order for them to get that apartment. And there is one experience that have impacted me the most, and it's a graffiti on Jefferson Street. That graffiti goes, it takes like four buildings at the top, and it says, you are in my hood now. And I walk that street a lot of times, and I never saw the graffiti until one tenant told me. He lives right across from the graffiti. He told me, Julian, even though I know my rights, even though I'm staying in my apartment with my family, I feel this place. So I think it's, it's, not, a, it's not about the, the physical displacement, right? Like moving out of Bushwick, but it's also the emotional displacement, the emotional struggle. The, the, the displacement at the human value, the human scale. Um, I feel like I'm going out of track, but, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, community has to be this, right? And I think the new residents have to think more about what the role is, what the role will be, because there is a community, there was a community existing in Bushwick so I think they have to think about what their role is getting into this new, this new community and, and how they connect. Instead of just like doing graffiti, saying you're in my hood now, but just like, you know, there are many, many things that we can talk and we can go on, but that is just an example. I don't know if... I could tell one story. And I was a neighbor on third floor on my building. She was an old lady. I think she was 75 or 78. Yeah, I think she was going to 78 years old. She was living with her son and grandson. But it looks like those two got tired of taking care of her. And they, bought, they, they sold out with their landlord. And that lady didn't want to leave. I think she was living there almost 50 years in that apartment. And for what I used to ask about her when she moved, because she was crying when she was taking her away from her apartment. She says, don't take me. I'll die if you take me out of my apartment. She only lasted one year in the, in the home that they put her. One year. And for what I heard, they were telling me that she was crying every night, asking to bring her back to her apartment. So when the new people came in, I told them, do you know who used to live there? Do you know the history of that apartment? Have you asked somebody about it? Do you know how much rent it was paying on that apartment? How much you paying now? And they only, they only tell me no. 
And then I asked them how much they were paying. They told me 2800 The lady that was living there only was paying $500. And they took it away from her apartment. And she only lasted one year in the home of the elderly home. That's the history of the apartment. So why don't you find out if that rent that you are paying now is right. That's all I could tell you. They only lasted for six months and they moved farther down because they found a better apartment. So I'm gonna bounce this mic right back to you, Gladys, because I wanted to follow up with a question about, because your story, and everyone's story so far, everyone is such an inspiration, but you've had this experience dealing with evictions and landlords directly. What do you think is the best way for residents to deal with community changes in neighborhoods due to gentrification? Like I said, there's a meeting every Thursday in Make the Road New York at seven o'clock, and everybody comes to ask for help. And the only thing I could tell them, learn your rights. Come to this meeting and learn your rights. Learn everything that you need to learn to fight with your apartment. Be strong. Find out and pass the word. Uh, that's all I would say. The only richness, the only thing that you're gonna make me feel good if you pass the information that you learn from here. Whatever you learn, pass it around to your neighbor. To the people that are getting in confrontation with these landlords, tell them, call the police if they're harassing. I tell them, that's the number one thing. If you need service, call 311. Then tell them, do not call them one time. Call them every hour if you need to. Every single day. Eventually, they're gonna listen to you. And this, this is what I have been doing. Like I said, I was almost evicted, and I, I was telling the landlord, you're not gonna take me out of my apartment. I've been living here for 20 years. My sons grew up here. And you think I'm gonna give it away? No, right, not yet. I told him, they were trying to buy me out for 10,000. I said, please, where are you gonna go with 10,000? Not even you. So I said, you want me to leave? Buy me an apartment. Or give me money to buy me an apartment. And I'll leave. You could have your apartment. Until then, you're gonna see me in my face and my lawyer into the court. And that's what I've been doing. And that's what I've been telling the people all around. And like Julian said, there's a lot of immigrant people that they're scared to go to court. They think they're gonna get in, they're gonna take them away from there. So since they've been hearing so many things that is going on in court, they don't want to go. And they, they get evicted. So that's why we're trying to reach out to them, getting them to understand that they could fight, they have rights like everyone else. But it's hard, it's getting hard. But like I said to all of you guys, you are welcome in the neighborhood, but please, learn what is going on in the neighborhood and be part of it. Help us to fight with this. If you help us, we could be living in the neighborhood and we will not have no eviction anymore because landlord will be fighting with everybody. And that will be hard for him because that's gonna be out of money out of his pocket. And they don't wanna do that. So please, pass the word, tell them to just get along with everybody else and be part of the family of the neighborhood that you go and live within. Just be part of it. I want to add something here. Yeah, I just want to add my personal experience uh, knocking on doors. I'm from Colombia, and, but I don't look, well, I don't know. I don't know how I look and what I look, but people don't, do not open the doors for me. They don't talk to me. They think I am a gentrifier. And yeah, I, I think I realized that it was hard for me to reach out to people. 
I'm a little lighter than other people, and that could make um, any difference. So I think um, just check in. It's really hard to organize. It's really hard to talk. People um, are not as open as used to be for many other reasons, right? So just check in. Check in with your neighbors. And if you want to reach out, you want to collaborate, well, find some allies, right? Find some um, Latino community members that you know and do outreach with them because it's what I do. Even though I'm from Colombia, I go out with some members of Make the Road, and when they when they see like faces of the community, they are more open to talk at the very beginning. And it's it's very sad to to say this, but it's the reality. It's what happens to me. But what I do is I I do outreach with some community members, and it's, it changes the dynamic completely. What we can do is check in, and not right after this, because we you know it might be 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, and we forget about what we're talking about here. But tomorrow, any other day, just check in with your neighbors. Ask them if they are okay. Ask them if the landlord is harassing them. In which way you, you, we can support them. And they might not talk at the beginning, but they will talk. If you try, if you try, you try. So. Yeah, I just wanted to add on to that and say absolutely, like, um, and I would say especially the burden is on the, the newer people. It's on us to go out and meet our neighbors and go knock on, like, go through your building and knock on the door and just say, hi, in case we haven't met, my name is, you know, so-and-so, what's your name, you know? And maybe even if, if, if the building seems up to it, starting a tenant association, which doesn't have to necessarily be incorporated or really fancy or anything. It can just be every on Thursday night for an hour, everybody comes to your apartment and you guys just talk about, you know, everything's good. Like, you know, like when Leon was saying, everything's good. Has the landlord said anything to you? Are you, do you need any repairs done? Let's do 311 complaints together. Cause if all, you know, let's say there's, there's 40 of you in the building. If all 40 of you sit down and make a 311 complaint, they have to, they're, you're gonna get results faster than if it was just one person putting in a 311 complaint. So just like supporting each other in that way, even in the smallest ways, it just makes it harder um, for the landlord to harass you. It makes it harder for people to get displaced and it also makes it harder for them to do it in secret, you know, without anybody knowing, like, which happens a lot of the time. Those are great suggestions. Also, don't overlook the power of block associations so say you're feeling kind of like alienated within your own building because maybe you're outnumbered in your building. Um, check out the street, check out the block associations too. That's what I do in my part of the neighborhood too, so. Also, one more thing. I think that um, this, if, if your landlord is not providing, has not doing repairs, if you are living in unsafe conditions, under the law, you have every right to withhold your rent. So this is where, and especially those of us who are newer and are probably paying more and have, have the privilege, because as, as is mentioned, there is a high undocumented population. So those of us who have the privilege and are paying the higher rent, it's going to hurt our landlord if we withhold our rent. If you can get two or three people in your building who are paying a bit more to withhold their rent with, ten with other tenants who may be paying less, that's going to hurt your landlord. And like I said, under New York State law, you are protected uh, to do that. That is 100% within your right to organize a rent strike. If your landlord, if your building is falling apart, if you don't have any services, if you've been complaining to them about certain repairs, of course, make sure you document everything so that you have proof if they try to retaliate against you. But 100% is within your right, and you can withhold your rent at any time. Lots of good information, and that's just like with this today's panelists, uh, some folks have also brought some paper material with some, uh, we have a toolkit at the table over by the registration. If you want more information in English and Spanish, it's there. Many of the resources that folks have been talking about today, as well as uh, things from some of the organizations that are participating today, so feel free to take a sheet. My Last question is for Ariel, but of course, anyone else in panel, please feel free to chime in if you have also a response to this. As Bushwick is dealing with these community changes, what would you like to see public, nonprofit, city agencies in Bushwick 
accomplish or tackle or address? Um, I think that's, that is a very interesting question. Um, it's, and it's, and it's very complicated as well. Um, I think that there, I think that the system in which that we, that we live under makes it a little bit difficult. There may be well-intentioned efforts to, um, to help or to make things better. And sometimes, um, just based off of the way that nonprofits have to run and things like that, it, it can actually end up not doing what they set out to do. It can actually end up maybe hurting the community a bit. Um, so I would say that whatever efforts are made, obviously it needs to be hand in hand with community members and not necessarily uh, you know, appointed um, people. I think that good old fashioned grassroots door knocking, hi, can I get, you know, how do you feel about this? Engaging with community members, going out to parks and things like that, public places and speaking directly to the people on the street, to the people who live in Bushwick, um, would be a much better way to go about getting information about how, um, how things can get better, how to provide services and all that. But I also think that it, importantly, I would love to see initiatives that empower residents to have their own self-determination, to determine what they want to do for their own community versus entities, outside entities coming in and, and deciding for themselves what they think needs to be done and then doing it from there. Um, I think that there needs to be a lot more, I would love to see a lot more community input um, town halls, things like that, where the community can actually say what they want and what they feel would be the best thing versus somebody else coming in. What she's saying is true, but we try one time. Um, we did what they said. We said what we need. We never being heard. They came asked us for some um, ideas. We gave them the ideas, and it didn't work. They never used them. They just used us, just to say, oh, we did this, and then we got this from the neighbors. With the buses, the changing of the lines of the buses. First they went to Queens, and the change was going to be done in Brooklyn. I said, why are you went in Queens? You're supposed to tell us first. You should come and ask for ideas, ask us for if we want, uh, want it or not. They came two days before they were going to start the routing, the starting the routing, uh, already changes. The changes was going to start in two days and gave us that information, asked us questions. I said, what are you going to do in two days? Nothing. You're not going to change it. We're going to get more sick, because sick people here. We asthma and everything because buses, many buses are going to be coming through this neighborhood that never were running like that before. And you came and asked that two days before? Okay, what you have done after you asked that those questions? Nothing. There was a now we are working on the rezoning. They're asking us all these questions. They, we brought people t to these meetings and stuff like that, and what they did. They still decided they're going forward for these buildings and not doing nothing what the community is saying. So that's the strength that we need. We need the people that are coming to our neighborhood to, re to come together in this fight because it's not working all by ourselves. Only Latinos are not working. We need everybody, everybody to come. I post every, in my building, my block, I always post in these flyers, come over to this meeting, or come over to the assembly. I don't see them. And that's what I told them. Work together, because together we could make it and these changes that's been going on. 
I told the people that move in, don't leave. Leave somebody that you know that is going to be staying there, could get another people, and then that landlord doesn't raise that rent. Once everybody moves, that's a new rent high. But if you list somebody in there, it's not going to happen. Because you're going to be renting the other rooms. And your name is still staying there. One person is staying there. But no, when they, everybody moves, then the rent comes higher. And that's what I say. It's not working when we get the community together and give our ideas, they're not using it. I don't know why they, got, they gathers us in the community to say something and they're not using it, they're not listening. So I ask for you guys, come over, come with us. If you see any assembly that is going on, show up and hear us and participate. Come along to the rallies, to the marches that we do. It's for the better of the community, not for us. It's for the community, for everybody that lives in the community. I don't know if Bushwick needs to be rezoned. I don't know if, I think that is a question that I keep asking to myself. I think we have enough affordable housing. Well, we have enough housing. I don't know. I, I think that it doesn't need to be rezoned. And what I'm seeing here in Bushwick with this rezoning, which is called the Bushwick Community Plan, just to make it up, <laughs> right? I think it's like what is... What is happening here is what happened in Williamsburg and Greenpoint. The community was drafting a rezoning plan. It was driven by the community, and it was taken away from the community. It's what we're seeing here today. Same story. Same story. And yeah, I want to just like give the question open. Do we need to rezone Bushwick? No, right? De Blasio came up with this plan, which is the MIH, Mandatory Inclusionary Housing. He's, he's supposed to work in about 200,000 units, preserve 120,000 units, and create 80,000 affordable units. He chose 50 neighborhoods in, in New York City to create those 80,000 units. If you look at those neighborhoods, are low and medium income communities. Why? Why those neighborhoods? I just want to leave the question open. This is the question that I always ask them when I go to those meetings. The MRI, they say, is for 44,000 the people that could apply to this apartment that they call it affordable. I just want to ask you, do you know anybody that they lived in that neighborhood earns 44,000? Not me. I live there. I have a job. I don't earn 44,000. I can't apply for those apartments. The family that lives in this neighborhood is only 20, under 20,000. Probably the highest, probably is 25. My daughter makes 28. So that's why I asked the question. Where do you get these, these amounts? Where do you get these numbers? And you know what they tell me? In Albany, the people that live in Albany. But those are homes. That's where they get these, um, uh, these, num these numbers. Why don't you come and do it here in these neighborhoods? And then you will know the real, uh, real amount that the people earn here. So that's what I asked. 
who do you make in these buildings? Not for us. And then they said they only could give you the 10 or 20% out of the 100. What is 20, 10 apartments when it's 1,000 people out there homeless? So that's the question that I ask them all the time when they're there asking me and telling me that, oh, it's for the people that earn 44. I can't even apply for it. And I have a city job. I can't apply for it. Yeah, that's what you said. <laughs> yeah, Gladys is what is she's basically saying is that the the income that you will need to qualify for one of these affordable apartments is calculated by the area medium income, which is the five boroughs plus two counties, I think Westchester and Fulham. People that live there make way more money, right? So that's why the, the medium income goes higher. And it's basically like the way it was calculated. So they're not thinking about people who is actually living in these communities. And I think at this point, well, we can go all the way to Albany, right? It's where the, the laws uh, are made. And I think we're at, uh, at the point that landlords decide who live where, right? Because they have the power. They have the power. They have a lot of, they do a lot of lobbying in Albany. And I would like to talk a little bit more about like the um, statewide campaigns and actions and strategies that not only make the road, but organizations all the way in Buffalo and, and Albany are doing. Because cause if you look at gentrification, that is only one angle. We also have the rent laws, we have the rezonings, among other things. So if there is time, I would love to discuss a little bit about rent laws and yeah no it's all very useful information and the only other thing to mention about all this talk about MIH and everything a lot of these new housing developments they're all based on this lottery system and how fair is that system really we're talking about setting people up to fight for the measly crumbs for each development on a lottery <laughs> so you and maybe 80 percent like how, how many percentages what are the percentages for people who apply for these lotteries it sets, it's kind of setting people up for these impossible standards for housing. It's just not sustainable. So I wanted to just take a little pause to uh, give uh, Ariel some time to talk about updates in regards to rezoning and what work she's doing with uh, G Rebels and uh, also pass it along to Julian and Gladys and other uh, folks who wanted to share updates about how you can get activated in the community. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm really glad we kind of like organically got to this um, <laughs> this exact topic. I will preface everything to say that the debate about the rezoning is very contentious. It's very heated. People are very passionate about it, and rightly so. These are our homes. We're literally talking about our homes and our ability to stay in our homes. Um, and, you know, so that being said, there are divisions and differences in opinion and tactic and all that. Um, so I just want to be respectful of that. This is my opinion. This is my organization's opinion. And there are other opinions out there that are just as valid that I may not agree with. Um, so for us, bringing up the Bushwick community plan, you know, for, for us, I, I have to question the validity of it. I have to question the, the, the necessity of it. Um, I, I know that the people on the steering committee genu genuinely love and care for Bushwick and genuinely are, want, are a part of this because they want to make sure that we are not the next Williamsburg, that people are not displaced. My, and, and I understand that and respect that. Where, um, where the other side comes in is that when has working with the state 
ever really worked out for disenfranchised communities. Historically, never. <laughs> um, so to say, and I think that, and I think that the, there's a lot to kind of analyze there, but you know, for the sake of time, I'll just, um, I think that it, it, it's very difficult because a lot of, um, like Gladys said, you know, there, in February, there was a meeting where city, plan, like, you know, c city agents and city developers came in, and after four years, this has been going on for four years, these steering committee meetings have been going on. So this is four years of work that people, community members, have been putting their time, their effort, their dedication into crafting a plan that they hope will save Bushwick in a way, save the community of Bushwick to preserve the character, the culture, the community. Um, and this, and there was a city worker, I cannot remember his name, I'm so sorry. Um, he, he works at the Department of City Planning. Winston Von Engel. Yes, Von Engel. Came into the meeting, presented a plan um, that was absolutely nothing that looked like the Bushwick Community Plan. Absolutely nothing like what the Bushwick Steering Co Community Plan Steering Committee asked for. And this is, and the, the plan has yet to be finalized. So if this is what they're already presenting, that meeting was very contentious. People were very angry. The people stormed out, voices were raised. It was very, very, very tense meeting. So if my concern is that if this is, if the plan has yet to even be finalized, and if, and also keep in mind, none of the, these are all recommendations. None of these recommendations are legally binding. So they're just kind of, hey, this is what we want to see. So that, as was mentioned before, the state can say, look, we got community support. Look, this is what the community said. This is what we gave. We came to a happy medium. Um, and as was also mentioned, you know, 20% of a building, affordable housing that's not really affordable, we're, we're already recommending and asking for crumbs in a sense, you know, to, so to know that we're not even gonna get those crumbs. He came in and presented this plan that again was just not what anybody asked for and when people confronted him and rightfully so were angry, he said to us, we are here to preserve the character of the buildings, not the people in them. Yep. To a room of Bushwick residents, some long time residents, 50, 60 years, some of these people have lived here. That's what he said to them. This is a city employee who works at the Department of City Planning, Winston Von Engel. So if this is where we're at now, there's a lot of us who are genuinely concerned about the validity of passing a plan like this because once it goes into the ULERP process, it's out of our hands. The city can do whatever they want. And so that's why, again, none of these recommendations are legally binding. And the affordable, you know, we can question the affordable housing, who is it really affordable to? Um, so that's why, you know, G Rebels working with Mikasa and, um, and BAN, which is the Brooklyn Anti-Gentrification Network, we are against the rezoning. We just feel that why, why would we open the door to let that happen, to become the next Williamsburg, to say, you know, the, Williamsburg community, they had a plan. They asked for certain things. They, you know, they, uh, for affordable housing and all this stuff, and they have gotten, you know, exactly. 10 years later, nothing, you know? 10% of what they asked for, which was already, you know, not what could have been asked for. You know what I mean? So it's just very complicated. So we're doing a lot of work around there. Um, there was a very um, tense, action recently where we went to a CB4 meeting um, because, yeah, they, they were planning to hear the Bushwick community plan and it got very tense. Um, again, you know, love and respect to all parties involved. This is a very passionate subject. It's a very tense subject and I truly genuinely believe that the intentions of the people doing the steering committee, you know, they really believe that this is our last, this is, from their perspective, this is all we can do. This is our best hope. This is our best shot. And we just want to say, don't sell out Bushwick. Why would we rezone? Again, if we're only rezoning these the, you know, low-income communities of color, why allow the state to come in and do this when, again, none of these recommendations are legally binding? Um, so we're uh, basically what we have coming up, uh, ways you can get involved. We have a petition for you know, to say no to the rezoning. Um, we also are going to be holding a community forum um, in August, so please look out for that. 
um, that kind of breaks down what is the rezoning, what is the Bushwick community plan, you know, how can we move forward as a community, that sort of thing. Um, and we're going to be flyering. If you guys would like to get involved with that, you can speak to um, me or um, my friend in, on our G Rebel shirt. We can get down your information and pass out um, so we can let you guys know when we're going to be flyering to kind of get community awareness. Because a big part of this too is that you know most a lot of Bushwick residents don't really know that this is happening, that there we're even up for rezoning. So the community needs to know that we're up for rezoning before a community plan can really be passed about the rezoning. I'm part of the community board in this district. I missed that meeting when the something blew up in there. I wasn't that when that man came out insulting us and we asked him to apologize. He didn't do it. He was attending straightforward. They didn't want to do it. I said, well, we cannot work with you. And that's what they did. Now they are, we are going, we got middle people, which is our, um, how you call this? The people, uh, Reynoso and the council members. Two council members is going to be in between them and us. They don't want no more participation with us because we told them off that day. How the hell you came insulting us here in front of us and tell the oldest? And they didn't apologize. They left without any apology for anybody in there. That's what I, I told them. I say, how do you want me to accept this when we made two meetings, we, we made an assembly with the people of the community of Bushwick, and they tell you what they need, and you came out with this? They didn't want to hear it. And it's true, they're having another one, and we, we have to be there. Please participate. If you see any flyers about this, come over. Like I said, the strength is in the people. If we are together, we fight with it, we'll come out winners. If we're not, we're going to lose Bushwick, too. I was in Williamsburg. I moved to Bushwick because of that. But I want to stay here. I don't want to move out. This is my home. Like I say every time, this is my home. You're not going to take me away from my home. We're going to fight for the until the end. Okay? Well, I think Ariel and Gladys have said a lot. I just want to say that in order for fight against the rezoning, you need to know what rezoning means. And part of the problem in our community in Bushwick is that people do not engage as much as we need, as much as the community needed. So I think we need to take the time to understand what rezoning means and explain that to the people but also using the words that they will understand. So I think one thing that I've learned in Make the Road is that we have access to information. You know, we, some of us might have gone to college or, you know, have certain level of education, but we need, we need to understand the community that we're working with. I think we need to bring those words, that language over there, which is so complicated, and bring it to the ground so people can engage easily and participate. We have the, the tenants committee meetings every Thursday at Make the Road, and, but we need to understand what, is, what, is, what rezoning means because Yes, you can mobilize people, you know, you can, you can fill a room, but they need to know wh what is going on, right? Otherwise, it will be like less impactful. Um, 
Yes, I, Make the Road is participating in, in the Butchbury zoning. It's been engaged like in different subcommittees, the steering committee, but also the other subcommittees. And I think that I'm talking like from my perspective as a human being, as a tenant, right? Um, once again, I don't, I don't think that Bushwick needs to be rezoned, but it's really hard. It's really hard because the, the foundation of these processes are, are the same, right? Growing and development. And it happens here, it happens in Colombia, it happens everywhere. The population is growing and the buildings, the cities, get old. So they use those two reasons to change neighborhoods. And if you look at, if you look at those two reasons, are just like basic things, right? That each city planning city planning department will, will look will look right so it's, it's it's really hard to like go against this uh process that we need to and and once again like bringing all of the terminology all the ideas all the concepts to the ground so people can can grasp it can understand it you will i think like more efficient and more productive all the engagement and all the participation Are there any actions that Make the Road um, is doing on a weekly basis that you want to let folks know about so they can get involved? Yeah, so in the um, tenants committee meetings, we also have like a calendar for the month. So, you know, if there is a hearing that is going to happen on the bush rezoning, we, we list it and we say it on the, um, on the meetings. But we recently, um, this place, which is 1601 DeKalb, there is a laundromat, at the post office, um, parking garage over there, two parking garage, yeah? Out and two buildings. That property wants to be rezoned, right? Like the, the developers, so I've made the application to become that area, that, that, that piece of Bushwick into two towers. I think it's 122 apartments. And they wanted to get the, the, um, the deal. We're gonna build these two towers. We're gonna offer 20% of affordable housing. We say no. We say no. We asked the developers to withdraw the plan and I was away, uh, I was out of the States like two weeks ago, so I don't know where we at right now. But we went to a hearings, we know we meet with the council members, we, we, we meet with the, um, the board of president. And yeah, so I think auctions are happening all the time, every week. And you can go to the website, you can um, talk to Gladys, to me, we're not the only ones working in, on the housing department. It's also Jose Lopez, who was in the video earlier, uh, Angel Vera. So we are actually like a few people working on, on the housing department. And you can talk to us. Yeah, I need to like get updated on events for the month, but actions are happening all the time. So it's, you know, keep, keep tuned and yeah. Again, we want to thank these wonderful panelists. Please join me in a round of applause. Thank you so much.